Hi, here's another of Mrs. H psychology revision videos. This time, paper three again, addiction topic, and it's the theory of planned behavior. So let's look at what's on the specification. It wants you to know about the application of the following two theories, theory of planned behavior and also Prochaska, which we'll do in a separate video. So here, the theory of planned behavior is really useful for practitioners. They use it um, to predict outcomes of treatment programs. And the idea is trying to work out the amount of intent that people have to, um, to change their behavior. So the idea is that it's explaining how beliefs, somebody's beliefs, will actually determine their behavioral change. So it's based on three areas. Okay, so the areas we're going to pause in a minute. So areas are that you need to learn attitudes towards the addictive behavior. Subjective norms, so subjective or social norms about that behavior, and also their perceived behavioral control. So these feed into their intention to change their behavior, and obviously that should have an impact on their behavior. We also have a direct link between their perceived behavioral control and their behavior. So just pause for a minute, have another look at these, and see whether you can recreate that on a piece of scrap paper. Three areas, attitudes, Subjective norms, perceived behavioural control, lead to intention, and that should lead to a behavioural change. And we'll add some more detail in a moment. So, moving on slightly, the attitudes, adding a little bit more detail. These attitudes can be positive or negative of the behaviour and also their outcomes. Subjective norms are our belief about what is expected or acceptable behaviour. And here it's in terms of the norms of the group. So his subjective norms here are pressures maybe to continue with the behavior or pressures to give up. And perceived control is the most important component of, according to this model. So how much control has the individual based on their internal and external factors? And this, remember, is their perceived control. So how much control they perceive themselves to have. Okay, so taking that a little bit further and developing it a little bit further, let's look at it applied. So attitudes towards the addictive behavior, for example, is it having a negative effect on them, on their lifestyle, on their family, etc., on their work? And this is really important for initiation of treatment. Okay, so it has a big, it's important in terms of are they actually going to go and seek some help? Subjective norms, what is the norm of their group? Is it, for example, to drink heavily? Is it to regularly use cannabis, etc., etc.? This is obviously important in terms of establishing what social support is around them and trying to make adjustments to any negative influence. And then thirdly, the perceived control, behavioral control, their perception of their situation. Remember, it's not reality, it's their perception. So, for example, if they don't think they're going to be able to attend treatment sessions, obviously their intention to change it's not going to be very strong and we can have a direct link through to behavior so it's important to just state that this model also says that this perceived control is linked directly to behavior this perceived control is linked directly to behavior so therefore could be a predictor of behavior just on its own so although the model suggests these three are important in terms of their intentions and therefore behaviour change, perceived behavioural control is, has a direct link to their behaviour. So remember that you can be apply, um, asked to apply to a STEM, uh, this knowledge to a STEM or use a real life scenario to explain this. Okay, So that's what you would um, highly likely be asked to do. If we go on to evaluate the model, let's have a look at some evaluative points. So we have O and Zhu used a questionnaire to assess gamblers' previous gambling, their social norms, their attitudes, perceived control, for example, on their skills, and also their self-control and intentions. And what they found was positive correlation between the, their attitudes, their intentions, and their actual behavior. So this supports the validity of this model. We also have Godin et al. investigated how successful the theory was in terms of smoking behaviour. And they also found a significant positive correlation between behaviour and intention, intent, really, intention level. They concluded that prevention programmes should help smokers focus on willpower needed to give up smoking. And also they should alert smokers to the effort that's required 
to modify, to change their spoken behaviour. So emphasising um, and trying to get them to see that they have more co control over the, out the outcomes and the consequences. A couple of criticisms, very quickly. Critics like Armitage have said that the TPP uh, has been criticised for being too rational, so it doesn't take into account emotions and compulsions that people have. Um, and so, for example, when you're filling out a questionnaire about your attitudes and your intention, you might not anticipate the, the emotions that actually cause you to have this compulsive behaviour in real life. And these strong emotions might help to explain why some people act irrationally. For example, they may have an intention um, like not drinking, but then they still go ahead with it and drink excessively. Okay, we've also got CLAG, studied 350 substance abuses in Australia and found that recovery was consistently more successful with those individuals who decided to give up themselves rather than the ones who were coerced. In other words, for example, they were, they were kind of being forced into it, for example, with a court sentence. So an alternative theory called self-determination theory, according to Clagg, is preferable to the TPB because it emphasises the importance of self-motivation. So in other words, your intrinsic motivation. And although the TPB, TPB is good at predicting behavioural intentions, it doesn't seem reliable at predicting actual behavioural change. Finally, little um, past exam questions. So one here, briefly outline the theory of planned behaviour for two marks. And you can pause to have a look at what's on the mark scheme. And finally, explain one limitation of this theory again for two marks both from sample <clears throat> spec papers. And that's it.